Hello, and welcome back to the Simplifiers podcast, where we take topics in business and in life and simplify them. Now, let's go ahead and flash forward way, way, way in the future. You've been doing this business now, your very own small business that you've been running for 10, 15 years. Let's ask yourself this really quick question. Are you still doing the same thing you were doing on day one as you're doing in year 10? Am I willing to bet the answer is no. So my special guest today, her name is Jennifer Perkins, and she is going to simplify how we can make a creative career pivot. So in case you may want to do something different in the course and life of your small business. Now, Jennifer happens to love marketing just as much as she loves making things. And she knows that to be a successful in the creative industry, you've got to do both. She has a genuine love for all things business, social media, and marketing, and that's really driven her career. Now, you've probably seen her work over the last 15 years. She's hosted television programs for DIY Network, consulted for Michaels, also worked with brands like Hobby Lobby, Tom's Shoes, creating content for HGTV, and so many more. You've probably even seen her featured in CNN Money, The Wall Street Journal, Inc. Magazine, and Fortune Small Business. So, this girl knows a few things. She's been around the block, and we're going to break into this topic together. I'd like to welcome to the Simplifiers podcast, Jennifer Perkins. Hey, Jennifer. Hello, Mary. Thank you so much for having me and for that glowing intro. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> so, okay, you've been in business for a bazillion years, right? You are mm -hmm. now 85 years old. Gosh, you look so great. How did oh, that thanks. happen? Right. The wonders of Botox never cease. Yes. And so, <laughs> you know, the reality is, and I've been in business for 16 years. I started mine in 2003 myself. So here we are going, oh my God, we've got teenagers for brands and businesses that we've run. I'm surely guessing that where you were year one is not where you are in year 15, right? No, not, I mean, in the general DIY sense of the word, but not, not so much. Yeah. So when you first, first, first started out, what kind of a business were you running? When I first started out, I was running a jewelry company, like handmade jewelry. So a very small kind of cottage company where it was like, you ordered a bracelet, I made the bracelet. Yes. And so, you know, very like one-to-one -one direct sales type of thing. Yeah. And so. what got you into starting a business in the first place? Uh, you know, it was like a lot of people within the creative DIY business sphere, where it was one of those things where I was making the jewelry, people like the jewelry, can I buy the jewelry? And then just kind of one thing led to another. And as legend goes, I got a feature in a magazine and I had to quit my day job. It was either tell the people who made all the orders, like who placed all the orders, like I can't, I have a day job. I can't physically make all these. I don't have the time. Or I had to quit the day job and go make all the jewelry orders. So I made all the, I just quit the day job and made all the jewelry orders and never looked back after. So I had to kind of learn real quick how to run a business. Yeah, no joke. And I would consider you an artist. Um, you're creative, right? And so a lot of times for us creatives, when we start a business, it's not like we went to business school. We, we kind of learned our MBA on the fly, right? Through our exactly. beautiful blunders and mistakes and all along the way, right? So, okay. When, at what point in your career did you jump off from that security of the full-time job? Were you a couple of years in or you're like, day one, I'm out? Um, you know, it's kind of like you hear those, like I saw a quote yesterday, I think from the guy who started Twitter and it was like, you know, about like, it looks like this overnight success that really took 10 years to start, totally. you know, so yeah. So no, I mean, when that happened, I was already to the point where I was coming home every single day from work, making jewelry until it was time to go to bed, mailing orders on my lunch break for my day job, you know, waking up early before I had to go to work to put together the packages that I could mail on my lunch break. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, you know, there was already, it was just about neck and neck as to what I was getting paid anyway. So it wasn't this giant romantic leap of faith that it sounds like. I mean, it was, but you know, it was already sustaining me in some ways. Yeah. And then you're like, right, this is it. I'm taking the leap. And you moved back to straight doing jewelry and working full time with that as your primary income. So, mm -hmm. okay. So let's flash forward to, to where we are now. So your business and career has really evolved over time. So how did you handle some of those big curveball changes and, and still thrive? through it? You know, some of the changes that I've made were intentional and some were 
accidental, you know, um, with my jewelry company right about the time I was hitting serious burnout with it. And I was just kind of over it. It just kind of magically lined up with the fact that my website broke. I was pregnant with my daughter and this was back when my space was my number one refer yes. in the name of my company. I know so that old, but you know, um, the name of my company was Naughty Secretary Club. And so majority of my orders were coming through people interacting with me on MySpace. And randomly about that time, MySpace decided the word naughty was a four letter word and blocked my site. So my orders, that was the only social media platform. That's why when everybody's like, I put all my eggs in the Instagram basket, I'm like, don't do Don't it. do it. Don't do it. Yeah. So you know, MySpace blocked my site. That was a huge hit. I was pregnant with my daughter and my website broke. And then I was just at burnout. And I was like, you know what? Peace. Like, I'm just not, this is a sign, you know, that I am not supposed to do that. And so then I just kind of took a brief hiatus. And then when I got back into DIY, it was more general in content creation, as opposed to like, you want a bracelet, I make the bracelet. Right. You know, I just kind of got burnt out on that system. So tell me about your process then. I mean, because obviously that is the universe giving you a sign saying, okay, this th- that chapter is <laughs> done, right? Let's move on to the <laughs> next. next chapter, right? You had a baby, right? There's also a process there that you just have to be in that zone when you go through that. Um, but then what was your process to go, okay, well, what's next? Like, how did you determine that? Was it through journaling, talking to a coach, something else? Um, you know, no, it was one of those kind of things that like, I knew eventually, like I had to work. I mean, there was just that, you know what I mean? Like my husband was not going to let me sit at home and just like coo over the baby for forever. (laughs) Unfortunately, as as much as I would have loved to do that. (laughs) And, you know, it's kind of like I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's also worked in this space for years. And he was saying like, gosh, I'm just, I'm tired of coming up with new ideas and writing books and doing videos. I think I'm going to retire. And I was like, would you do this anyway? Even if you weren't getting paid, like, would you make crafts and do creative stuff? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, well, then why not get paid for it? Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my thing is even when Tallulah was a baby and I wasn't making jewelry, I was still doing crafts and creative things. So it's like, I might as well take a picture of it and get paid for it, you know? So via the jewelry connections I had, I just kind of had reached out to some companies and that's when I kind of started down the path of, creative content for other people and other brands and other companies. So at that point, then... Does that make sense? Yeah, you totally became a blogger. You're creating content for your website, Mm -hmm. right? And was it under the name Jennifer Perkins or was it under a business name? Um, Originally, I was still doing... uh, I pivoted into the craft, like, content, the blogging stuff as under Naughty Secretary Club, because that's the website I still had. Yeah. And then, at, you know, after a point of creating content, and I worked, I worked for like blog her as their DIY editor, who's now she media. Mm-hmm. Um, I got a deal as a magazine editor for a children's magazine that was put out through Walmart called Kids Crafts 123. And at that point, I was like, you know, I should ditch the Naughty Secretary Club mm-hmm. part, and I should get jenniferperkins.com. Yeah. And so... Because, I mean, and not that I have anything wrong with Naughty Secretary Club. I still own it. But it just redirects. But, you know, then I had to go through the process. Of course, JenniferPerkins.com was already, you know, somebody was sitting on it. And I had to go through the channels of buying that and blah, 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 blah. But that's when I made that pivot over kind of leaving Naughty Secretary Club behind and then just full-time going by Jennifer Perkins. Mm, And, you know, I remember, so I was living in Austin, Texas at the time when you were launching all that. And we've kind of shared similar circles. You know, I, it's funny, Jennifer, I was looking back some old photos and I found a photo of you from like a party that I think I threw about I don't know, 15 years ago. And there you are on my couch. So I, you know, I remember back in the day that Naughty Secretary Club was just like people knew the knew that brand. It was a household name in in our circle of friends and things. It must be hard to kind of step away from that and be like, no, this is me, Jennifer Perkins, when you're taking that role and kind of evolving in your brand. Um, it is definitely, I mean, now so much time has passed. It's the kind of thing, like I say that to people or I say like the Austin craft mafia or things that used to resonate with people here in Austin. Totally. And they're just like, Oh, what's that? You know? And I'm just (laughs) like, it's nothing like it's, you know what I mean? Or whatever. Like, I mean, but at the time it was, 
I don't know. I wouldn't say it was hard because like the burnout feeling was still there. And I still so associated Naughty Secretary Club with jewelry. Mm -hmm. Not that I didn't love jewelry, but I mean, I am literally just 15 years later starting to make jewelry again. Like I just, I am so thankful for the opportunities that that gave me. And I loved making that jewelry. But you know, when you, I often say like, be careful what you wish for, because it's like, you think you want to make jewelry as a full-time job, but when it really is your full-time job, like it's just like any other day job that you can start to get real annoyed with. Mm, and so That is the truth. Yeah. I mean, when I started the simplifiers in 2003 in Austin, Texas, we were events. We produced mm-hmm. weddings and, and corporate events and things. And, you know, that I think that there's a, a truth to that is that when you build a brand, whether it is your own personal name or a company name that you work under, does it have legs to evolve with you? Um, I think mm-hmm. is a really important question. Um, you know, because I'm certainly not a wedding planner now and and the idea of working, you know, 40, 50 hours a week in the desk job and then another 15 to 20 on the weekends, at some point you are going to burn out. Like it's just Mm -hmm. not sustainable. So when you are going through this evolution, whether you're like, oh, I'm done with this or (laughs) my body, (laughs) my physical body can't take it. Like you, you learn that you need to pivot certain aspects of how you run your, your business and and what projects you take on. Like talk me through the process of that. So when you, you know, like discerning what types of projects you're going to take on next, how, how do you decide that? Um, now or then now, Now, um, you know, now it's really like, even though my kids are older, it's still really a matter of like what I have time for. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, another thing with projects is I try to, you know, now that the, I use the term influencer very loosely, but since that's a bigger space now, you know, I get approached all the time by different companies. Like, well, will you talk about this? Or will you talk about that? And just a lot of times it's just I don't know why it's not obvious to their marketing company that I'm not a good fit, but it's real obvious to me that I'm not a Mm. good fit. You know, like if I feel like I put it on my social channels and people are going to be like, why are you talking about that? Like, we know you don't do that. (laughs) Like, You know what I mean? If I feel that way, they should probably feel that way. So I think, you know, just I'm learning like what's a good fit for you and like what companies to align yourself with. Even the content that I create, you know, I tend to like, I'm can you see it? Like a Christmas mm-hmm. tree company, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, that's a company that wanted to work with me. And like, they have me do stuff like Christmas trees for national ice cream day, or that's my pride month tree. Mm-hmm. Like I knew that was a perfect fit. I already decorated crazy trees all the time. That wasn't like a stretch for me. So when a company comes to me with something like that, you know, I just know you just after, you know how it is. You've been in business a long time. After a while, you just know like, all right, that's something that's like already in my wheelhouse. My audience is going to get it. Like you just kind of start to get this sense of mm. what's going to work and what's going to fit. And that's how you kind of pick and choose. Yeah. So it seems like from the outsider looking in on your your career, um, you started off with a jewelry making business. Um, like you say, one to one. My build, they buy this, I build it and I send it off. And mm-hmm. then you shifted into content creation as a blogger, which then started to garner some press uh, attention as well as brands wanting to work with you to do sponsored posts or, you know, um, more interactive of campaigns and things like that. So what kind of work are you doing now? What's what's your focus? Where do you make your money? I would much rather work with a company like say the Christmas tree company where it's a contract and I know every month I'm going to get this much money. I'm going to be expected to do that type of thing. So I'm the brand ambassador for the Christmas tree company. Yep. That's a regular gig. And then, you know, I work for DIY network, HGTV, travel channel. It's all the same Yep, umbrella. And that is more of a, now up until January, I hosted a weekly show for them. Every Thursday you could tune into their Facebook live and it was DIY this with Jennifer Perkins. So that was another like regular, I was on a contract so I could expect that money coming, but then they kind of pulled back on their live programming. But now I still work for them, but it's more of a pitch basis. Like, mm-hmm you know, do you want like picture frames made out of tennis rackets, Mm -hmm. you know, and and thank God. Yes, yes, we do. And so things like, (laughs) so things like that, again, another company that I know is a good fit for me. So I have that regular 
income. And then, you know, I work for the occasional, like right now I'm working for an arts and crafts paint company. Um, I work for a hot glue gun company, but both of those things are companies that I use their products anyway, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what I always kind of think of. If it's a product that I'm like, God, that really sucks. Like, I don't like that product. Like I don't use it in my everyday life. I don't want to tell people to go use that glue. Then I feel weird about it. But if it's a hot glue that I honestly really like, like it's a hot glue that also comes in glitter or whatever, or, you know, they make Mod Podge, which everybody uses all the time. Yeah, that's a perfect so that's kind of how that works is I pick these lasting partnership deals when I can. And it sounds like also your your evolution has moved into kind of almost being a spokesperson for certain brands as well. I mean, you know, you're testing out their products and you're showing their audience or your audience as well. Like, here's how it works. Here's how to make something <laughs> out of something, you know. Um, and, and so I guess what I'm curious about in this evolution, again, is becoming, air quotes, an influencer in the Mm -hmm. DIY space. Um, You know, I mean, this has taken a lot of time and a lot of building relationships to get to that point where brands are having that open conversation. Um, Mm -hmm. What would you suggest to somebody who is interested in just starting out, like just once, like, hey, well, how do I attract, you know, so-and-so brand Mm -hmm. to become a... Uh, a sponsored post on my Instagram, where, what would you suggest to that person? Um, you know, one of the number one things that I know everybody knows this is like, well, a, you need to have good content. So there's just that you need to have good content. You need to have pretty well lit pictures. Like that's at the, in the end, at the end of the day, that's what they all care about is they want pretty pictures to share. Yeah. But when you have those pretty pictures, you know, leverage your social media platform. And I don't care if you only have like 20 followers, you know, tag those people or when you're using those products, you know, don't be afraid to DM them and go like, Oh, I thought you might, you know, enjoy this because it just takes one company a sharing your post on their feed because they need content all the time to bring you a much larger following. But you'd be surprised. A lot of times they'll reach back and say like, Oh, we love what you've been doing. Like maybe we could work together at some capacity. Like I had right after my daughter was born, I worked with the company. I mean, for years, like maybe even five years doing a weekly blog post for them. Wow. And the way I got that gig was I had met their marketing person at a conference. And every time I did a project on my blog and used their glue or their glitter or their tie dye, I would send them a link, not being pushy. Honestly, I didn't even think it would come to anything. Just being like, I thought you guys might like this. Mm -hmm. And then eventually that led to, we do like these. Like, can you like make these for our blog? Like every week, make some sort of like tie dye, a fake hula skirt or whatever it was I was making. Yeah. You know, so always don't be afraid to like reach out to brands. And like, I, you know, I message people, if I'm trying to really partner with the brand, I'll message them through Facebook and like, don't underestimate Twitter because a lot, Mm -hmm. everybody's DMing people on Instagram and all those big companies and brands still have Twitter accounts, Mm -hmm. you know, so tag them on a Twitter post, you know, like for the DIY industry, Twitter isn't a great platform usually because it's not visual, but if you're trying to get someone's attention, like the marketing team is there too. Yeah. You know, so So kind of reach out. And another thing is like, I like to try to go where those, where those people are, like be in the same space. Like you and I reconnected at mom 2.0. If a sponsor you want to work with is at mom 2.0, we'll get a ticket. Or if they're at Craftcation, you know, go to Craftcation, like, you know, find the conferences where the sponsors you want to work with are hanging out and get yourself there with a stack of cute little business cards. And don't be, don't be a crazy stalker person, you know, but go up and be like, well, hello there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't bring bring a suitcase of like, would you like to see what I make? But you know, you can. (laughs) Right. And I think, uh, I think what I'm hearing you say is also developing those relationships over time. Um, You know, Mm -hmm. if you're already creating valuable um, image heavy content on your blog or your social media feeds or in your email marketing, you're taking those pretty pictures. I mean, like I can think of um, wedding planners out there that are doing styled shoots already, right? They're already Uh making these beautiful photos and creating 
creating these beautiful arches or whatever, right? Tablescapes and things. There are materials in that that when you are creating um, that you could tag into this post. Yeah. And, and, you know, all of a sudden you have um, created something that's of value to that brand. And if you just take that one step further by hyperlinking their um, back to them in their um, in your blog post or tagging them in an Insta stories, you know, really mm-hmm. building and growing that relationship over time, that brand's person's going to go, hang on, who is this Jen person and why does she keep mm-hmm. on tagging me on stuff? And wow, look at what she's building. Oh, cool. She could make a piñata out of whatever, you know. Um, uh-huh. So like I think that's the secret is it's not a one and done. Oh, they didn't respond back, right? It's uh, – yeah. It's developing that time. It's a, it's a slow burn. And like you said, it's developing the relationship. And, you know, and you mentioned Insta stories. I didn't say that. I always think that's a great way to like tag people because it's real easy for people to just go, you know, share in my stories or what, you know what I mean? So then they're sharing it just with like the click of a button. Totally. So I think, I think that's something that like everybody should be. Yeah utilizing so okay so let's get back to the pivot and I, I have I chuckle every time I say that because I think about Ross moving a sofa up the stairs from friends <laughs> so pivot you know here we go um, now what has been the best way for you to forecast big changes coming in your work or life um, what's where do you do you listen to your gut do you listen to the market? Um, you know, I guess a bit of both, Mm -hmm. you know, I would definitely say more gut. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, it's not like I have some psychic vibe, but you know, when I'm hitting that wall of like, I'm kind of like done with this anyway, or, Mm -hmm. you know, or something keeps kind of nagging at me and coming back to me. And I'm just like, you know, I feel like I should be doing that. You know, the thing about a pivot for me is I'm one of those people that also is like easily, taken off the beaten path. And, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes I'm just like, is it a pivot or is it just me being like, what's that over there? Like, <laughs> yeah. let me go over here and just like ditch this thing I'm already on. Yeah. But when I pivot, you know, it's not like, say with the podcast, I'm still interviewing other creative business owners. It's not like I'm all of a sudden doing something you know, talking about hotel towels full time or whatever, that's an obscure reference, but you know (laughs) what I mean? It's still within the same genre. So, you know, when I, with the podcast, for instance, like I kind of had this feeling about like the Facebook live thing, like ending, like I was just like, I was kind of at a point where I was like, this is hard to be live and coming up with new ideas every week of something I could do for this audience. So I was personally kind of feeling that Mm -hmm. moment like I did with Naughty Secretary Club, where I was like, all right, I'm kind of hitting that space. And then I kind of just, you know, I knew that views were going down. Like I'm paying attention to my audience and the cues that like in reading articles about Facebook and the algorithm, like, you know, all that stuff is public that, you know, people about that time were going through the I hate Facebook phase real hard and heavy. And so, you know, putting those two things together in my mind, I'm like, well, maybe you need to start thinking of an exit plan or a backup plan. And, you know, what's that thing that's kind of been like pulling at you or nagging at you or you keep thinking of and keep going like, no, I don't have time. I don't have time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I kind of I've just learned to listen to those nags, those internal nags. Well, and I think as a creative, I think that's what we do best. We come up with. Uh, Yeah thousand bazillion ideas we're overflowing with ideas and and yes shiny object syndrome does happen it's for real yeah. it's like ooh shiny ooh shiny ooh exactly. shiny right I, I totally can resonate with that as well but i think what you also said is really true of like just paying attention to the market like what is happening out in the market space um with either tech or you know even i imagine design trends as well when you were a jewelry maker mm-hmm. like you know, um, can you talk to us more about that? So how do we, if, if there are makers and artists that are listening to this episode and they're realizing that, um, people are not into crochet anymore, but they're into blah, 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 blah. Uh Well, how do you, how do you traverse that kind of a change? Um, well, you either have to adapt or you're just really like, it's just not going to work or, you know what I mean? Or you can stay true to yourself, but you need to like, let's say, 
like weaving is super hot, right? right? Everybody's like all about the weaving. And like, I love weaving as much as the next guy, but the real like super muted colors of the popular weaving channels. I mean, you can just tell from like looking at me or looking at anything I create, like muted colors and I don't get along. Yeah. So for me in my space, I would make it my kind of weaving, right? I'm going to pay attention to weaving is popular. People want to learn how to weave. They want to know how to weave, but how can I make it a distinct Jennifer Perkins style weave? You know, I'm going to use like crazy colors. Maybe I'm going to use like an unusual surface, you know, maybe I'm going to weave the tennis racket behind me with neon yarn and, you know what I mean? Those kinds of things. So you need to pay attention to what's on trend, but don't just totally, you know, leave your brand or your style Mm -hmm. behind. But, you know, you can't just like completely ignore what's, you know, what's happening in the world around you. And if you want to, and you don't want it to affect your core work, like if you have an Etsy shop and let's say you make jewelry and you only like this kind of jewelry, well, then keep making that jewelry, but then maybe to pay the bills, like think about some jewelry that's more on trend and is going to sell better, Mm -hmm. you know, because trends, they wax and they wane and they come and they go. And even when I made Naughty Secretary Club, when I was at the height of my popularity, giant chunky necklaces were super in, you know, that was a big thing to have a statement necklace. And then also about the time I quit, that's when it became super popular to just have like a wee baby stamped brass charm on a chain. And you know what I mean? And that was just so not me. I was like, I don't even know how to do subtle, Yeah, you know? So yeah, and it's I think attention to that stuff totally. And I I think that uh, what I hear you say is really trying to stay true to your brand, try stay true to your you know the essence of of the art that, or product that you normally create, um, but then also stay stay aware of how the trends are are affecting and changing around you um, because you don't want to be like, well, this is it, this is all I do, and this I'm going to keep churning it out. And I'm going to invest thousands uh-huh. and thousands and thousands of dollars into my materials, and nobody is buying it. I, I think yeah. that that's the quickest way to commit career suicide is to not listen to the outside world. I mean, certainly you stay true to certain things, but you know, you have to keep your ear to the ground as well. Which leads mm-hmm. me to something you and I spoke about earlier off uh, uh, off air is the kind of the difference between what's called a forced pivot and mm-hmm. a voluntary pivot. Can you tell us the difference between those two? Um, well, you know, not to keep beating a dead horse, but like, let's, let's use like my podcast as an example. Like for me, that was a bit of a forced pivot because I lost an existing contract job. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I obviously needed to fill that time and that space and that loss of money with something else. Right. So I needed to pivot or change into something else. And again, it wasn't like, this hard right turn into something completely obscure. It's still within my brand. And yeah, it makes sense. But so that was kind of a forced pivot. And then also, you know, when I did Naughty Secretary Club, for instance, like one of the reasons I hit burnout is because I made, you know, jewelry that had like, you could choose A, B or C for a long time. Right. So I got so sick of making A, B and C. Mm. Well, what I really wanted to make was like, rando jewelry that was one of a kind. So I started pushing that to the front of my webpage all the time. That was what was in my newsletter. That was what was on the front of my page. I still had those things that paid the bills on the website. I just wasn't pushing that as hard. That's not what I was like getting featured in 17 or in L. And so eventually I was able to phase out those things that I was really not enjoying making anymore Mm. and pivot into what I was more passionate about just because I kind of, you know, it wasn't a switch necessarily, but, you know, I kind of pivoted my brand towards this more wackadoodle one of a kind things as opposed to this, you know, here are your choices. I have an A, B, and C. I made a resin jewelry, you know, I kind of phased out the resin into the wackadoodle. So those are kind of, you know, two examples. And I certainly can, it's so tricky because there are two different, um, 
points of view that are out there in the world, uh, especially for small business owners. One is scale your business, scale, 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 get bigger, bigger, mm-hmm. bigger, 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 massive, huge. And the only way to scale is to, you know, have systems and processes that you can replicate. So you have option A, option B, option C. So you uh-huh. can outsource that to a factory in Thailand, whatever, right? You know, yeah. like the idea of that, you're building a business that generates revenue that's replicable, right? Over and over and over again. And there, that certainly can be taken to the extreme, right? Um, but then there's the other side of like, well, do what really feels right for you and feels mm-hmm. like gives you um, – I talk a lot about one of my mentors, Daniel Laporte, her uh, – her book is called The Desire Map. So like gives mm-hmm. you your core desired feelings, like how you want to feel as a business owner. And it sounds like in that season of your life and business, you know, you're getting more excited about these one-off unique pieces mm-hmm. that you're making. Um, you know, it's so hard because where is the balance in that? Because yes, you do need to have uh, replicable systems and processes to run your business, but then you also want to do work that lights you up, right? Exactly. It's a tricky balance. It's funny that you say that. Do you remember Jenny Hart from Sublime Stitching? Mm. She was in she was in the Austin Craft Mafia with me and she's, you know, still going strong, but I just did an interview with her and it was the same kind of thing where there was a time where you know, giant companies were beating down her door to like license her products and to sell her products. And she had several employees and this and that and was totally scaling, you know, doing what everybody's chirping in your ear. You should do like you can't be a cottage industry or, you know, I would hear that with my jewelry stuff. Like you can't sustain this, this momentum, no matter how many assistants like you need to have it manufactured. But, you know, what Jenny finally came to a place and realized is that, like, sure, she could scale. Like, it could be huge. But she just didn't want to scale. Like, she liked being the person that sent out all the orders and wrapped everything up. Like, that's her zen. And, like, you know, responding to every customer. Like, she just made the conscious decision, like, I don't want to scale. Like, I don't want to be huge. And I think sometimes, like, especially in today's society where you hear, like, lady bosses and this and that, like. (laughs) You get what I mean? Like you feel like you're doing something wrong. Like, what do you mean you don't want to like rule the world? It's like, right. Well, I just, I just want to pay the bills and be happy. Like, right. And that, and that's okay too. People need to remember, like, that is totally fine. Well, and that so. that sparks a, a thought in my mind um, of a past episode that we did with Amanda Bolin of She Did It Her Way podcast. Um, I'll put the link in the show notes if you guys want to listen back to that. I mean, she also shared that same um, advice is that right at the beginning of starting a business, you know, is really getting clear on what kind of business do I want to grow? Because if you're building mm-hmm. an empire, right, a business that you know is going to, you know, eventually get taken on by a big brand and sold off to them so they can mass produce it and put it all in the stores and target or whatever. That is one trajectory. And, you know, some people do it, um, but some people, most people don't, you know, and, and when you, if you're building a lifestyle business or a brand around yourself, right, you're not necessarily looking to sell yourself off, right? Like you're not necessarily yeah. looking to go that route. It's, you know, a lifestyle and a business that serves your life as well. Um, so I think it comes back to deciding, well, what is it that I, I want to build right at the beginning, but then I think what I'm hearing you say is just checking in with yourself every now and again. Like, mm-hmm. is this the business I actually want? <laughs> like, yeah, you just need to be sure. You know, a good example of that too is when I did Naughty Secretary Club. I wanted to have. I mean, like everyone in my industry does. We all want to have product lines, and I got pretty far down the road with a company that wanted to do a product line with me. But one of the things they wanted to own the rights to was my name, my likeness, and my voice. You know, which sounds like completely crazy, but like that's not uncommon. Like if I'm going to be the face of the brand and I just wasn't willing to do that, like I don't care how much money they were going to give me because I was just like, no, I'm not going to sell like Jennifer Perkins as this brand thing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what you're going to do with that. So, you know, you have to be, you know, aware of that for sure. Okay, so let's go a different path. Um, oh, what about the times when you have to pivot because something, anything went terribly wrong in your business or you're faced with a bit of failure? What do you do then? Um, I mean, you know, you put your tail between your legs and you move on. But, you know, the, I think one of the number one things to do 
is, you know, I think when early in business, if something like that had happened to me, I might have like told myself, like, well, they just didn't get it. Mm -hmm. People just didn't get it. Like they don't understand. It's this brilliant thing, but people don't really get it. And I think with a little bit of like age and experience under my belt, I'm more able to step back and go like, now, why didn't, you know, what was I not doing that would have been better? Like, you know, and kind of think about reassess the situation. Like, did I not market it right? Did I not try to gear it to the right thing? Was it too all over the place, even though it was so streamlined and clear to me? Like, and I think sometimes that's why if you have an audience, like, it's really good to ask them, like, is this clear to you? Like, do you get why I'm doing this or what's going on? You know, really ask your customers or your fans or whatever, your followers, whatever they may be you know, and figure it out. Even if it failed, go back and ask the people that were, you know, knew about it and ask them like, you know, give me your honest opinion. Why do you think, and then take that honest opinion and yeah. don't get pouty about it and just kind of reassess. Like maybe that doesn't mean like all is lost and you can't ever try another business model. Just, you know, learn from what happened mm. and kind of, you know, make sure to incorporate those mistakes and just don't, don't repeat them. Yeah. It's such the truth. I call it like getting your Girl Scout badge. Like you got, I got this right? great old sash and I just put that next badge on there. Oh, like, Oh, Facebook ad campaigns. Oh, I learned that. <laughs> like you're, yeah. you're learning as you go um, in the process. But then I also think that if you have a bit of a, a playful childlike spirit uh, to this as being a business owner, that it, it's just a series of experiments, really, you know, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like when you put out a new product, when you put out a new campaign, when you put out a new blog post, it's a series of experiments to see, does it resonate with the the audience you have? Do people pull out their wallet and give you money for that product Mm -hmm. and service? It's nothing more than that. It's, It's not a failure on your character or your identity. It's just simply like, hey, that didn't work. That didn't work like you thought it would. Or like you said, you know, maybe it was genius, but you just couldn't figure out how to communicate that genius in a a succinct way for people. And that's okay. Yeah. And that's fine. And you know, another thing that I find, let's say you're a band and you put out the most amazing record of all time, but if you're not like touring for that band, if you're not, or if you're not touring with that record, if you're not talking about that record, if you're not put, you know, promoting it on social media, if you're not like having your fans talk about it, nobody's going to know that amazing record exists in any business. I don't care if you have a podcast, if you make jewelry, if you have a blog, like it's a package deal. You can't, you can't make amazing crafts and just be like, my crafts are the best. Nobody gets it. Like you have to figure (laughs) out the marketing aspect. You know what I mean? Like I always used to say like, it's 20% what you do and 80% how you spend it. Like it, and, and, and that's just a sad truth. I mean, I have run record labels. I have run jewelry businesses, podcasts, magazine, you know, you name it. It is the same all the way across the board. Like, yeah. So sometimes if it didn't fail or if it failed, you know, think about that with your next endeavor. Like, did you market it the right way or, yeah. you know, you, did you tell people? You have to tell people what you're up to and you have to tell them over and over and over again in this day and age of noise that is out in the universe right now. I mm-hmm. think you have to be unabashedly confident and going out there and saying, hey, I got this new podcast. Hey, I got this new line of jewelry. Hey, I'm doing this mm-hmm. new thing in my business and, and you have to do it over and over again because what is it? The statistics on Facebook, like, you know, 1% of your following is actually seen any of your posts mm-hmm. whatsoever. Ever. So get out there and tell the 99 because you they're missing the boat entirely. So exactly. w- just to wrap up a little bit, what do you think is um, the biggest mistake that small business owners tend to make when they're faced with change or how they run their brand? I think a lot of times with change, because I've done this a million times, it's kind of going back to what I just said. I think a lot of times people want to dig their heels in and be like, not realize that they need a change or even maybe on a level knowing they need a change, but just not, not making that change. Do you know what I mean? Just digging their heels in and going like, no, or if it's like a pivot and it's a second business going like, well, this is the way I marketed the other business and it worked great. Like, why isn't this working? This should clearly work. This is a tried and true method in each business you know, is a little bit different. Like you're going to need to like tweak that plan for each, Mm -hmm. um, 
each time that you do a different business. So I think a lot of times like people Mm self-sabotage that way with a business, you know what I mean? They just convince themselves like, well, it worked this way. Like, why isn't it working? Or it worked for her. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it working for me? And everybody's like business and adventure and path is a little bit different. And you just have to kind of yeah. Remember that. Well, and just don't forget, you are not a robot. Your clients and customers are not robots. Mm-hmm. So it's not as easy as just setting a program and saying, you know, if then statement, this is always how it will work and this is always going to be the outcome because the reality is it's not. You know, uh, current events, politics, uh, pop culture, fashion, all these things, the weather, climate control, like all these yeah. things are affecting so many mm-hmm. elements of why people do what they do, what they purchase purchase or don't purchase. Um, mm-hmm. So I think you have to be flexible and malleable to, um, you know, ride the tide when things change, both for your favor and not for your favor as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and hello, um, I'll, I'll be the first to admit as a creative, you got to get your business skills up to snuff just as much as you get your social media skills up. So girl, file, yep. your, file your taxes, you know, <laughs> get really learn how to track your cash flow um, and mm-hmm. manage the operation side of your business. Um, and of course, I've got two resources for you to help you snuff up and be better at being a business owner. One, listen to Jennifer's podcast. Uh, It's called (laughs) Creative Queso, and you can find it online at creativequeso.com, which I love, Jen, like you are like a soul sister. Like I love the fact that your podcast is all about queso and tacos. Like it's just so great. Um, Uh, And she interviews other creatives that are out there and, you know, understanding their process of how they mm -hmm. run their creative businesses, um, I think is really refreshing. And then of course, you know, the Simplifiers podcast, we've got a whole bevy of content that helps you on the business side of things, simplifying that down. So the simplifierspodcast.com. So Jen, I got a couple of questions for you um, that I like to ask everybody uh, that come on to our podcast. First and foremost, what's one book or blog that you're reading these days that's either inspiring you or maybe even poking holes and challenging you a bit? Um, you know, it's funny. Like I don't, this is going to sound so weird, but I don't usually allow myself, like it sounds weird to read or listen to fiction. But right now I'm like, I'm, I'm listening to a book called Circe, mm-hmm. which is really an amazing book. But, um, and I wouldn't say that's like necessarily poking holes, Um, the book I read before that was, gosh, I can't think of the name. It was by Derek Sivers, the guy who did CD baby and it, I'll send you the name of it, but it was really good. But also about the same time I was reading, um, Napoleon Hill's think and grow rich. I was about to have a real Texas moment. I was about to say heal, (laughs) um, (laughs) think and grow rich, which, um, is an interesting book. You know, I mean, it's a really classic, like talking about like Andrew Carnegie type people, you know, and it's, I mean, it's a little woo woo, but it's a little, it's business as well. And so I really, you know, took a lot of like furious notes Mm -hmm. reading that one and listening to that one. Then I also just did Shonda Rhimes year of yes, Mm -hmm. which was, Mm -hmm. it really was as like profound and wonderful. As everyone said, it took me a while to get to it, but I kind of never wanted it to end. Yeah, it's such a good book. And also um, Napoleon's book. I think what's so great about that is that the, you know, it's written many, many, many years ago, but the the mm-hmm. basic core truths of money mindset that are in it um, still are very rebel- relevant to today. So I'll put a link to those books in the show notes for people if you guys want to check them out. So tell us, Jen, who's one person in your network that you just feel is up to brilliant things right now that we could shine a spotlight on them and who knows, maybe even have them on the podcast one day? Um, you know, I think within my industry, I think there's just like so many people that I follow and I'm just like, oh man, you were doing like such cool stuff. Like I always love, for instance, um, Lisa Congdon's story of how she didn't get into like art and those kinds of things until much later in life. And now she's just crazy successful and always posting these like, you know, beautiful, motivational, inspiring type quotes and posts on Instagram. I really like her work. Um, Mm. I just recently chatted with Andrea Pippins, who is based in Stockholm, but she is an author and an illustrator. 
um, who has several books. She's got more coming. And I think she's got a really awesome feed. Like she just did a really cool um, illustrated guide to lessons on like 20 lessons I learned as a freelance illustrator about money for Grace Bonnie's new magazine, Good Company. And so it's a really interesting like beautifully illustrated guide about like, you know, how to charge for your time and, you know, how to factor in revisions with your art or what have you. Yeah. So I love and it. And I just, yeah, it's amazing. And I just like love her style. So those are two people that I always kind of, you know, follow on my channels and check in with. Excellent. Well, we'll put links in the show notes for um, both Lisa and Andrea. So you guys can check them out as well. So I believe gratitude and simplicity go hand in hand. Tell me what's one thing you're grateful for right now in your life? Geez, well, I mean, I'm grateful for you and this podcast. Aww, <laughs> go no, on. Really, I know, I know. But really, I know that sounds silly, but I really I am grateful for this podcasting platform and getting to talk to people like you and getting a chance to talk to these other awesome business people. And I'm grateful for the people that leave nice reviews and are like enjoying it, you know, and enjoying these conversations. Cause I didn't know if it would just be me wanting to pick these people's brains. And I'm not, you know, and I'm really not saying this is like in a self-serving, like, let's talk about my podcast way, but I really am grateful for those people that are listening and they enjoy it. You know, I feel like Sally feels like they like me. They really like me. And they like, the, <laughs> they like these conversations as much as I do. Cause I want to keep having them. Yeah. I love talking to people when you're like a mom and you live in the burbs and the days of me having the Austin craft mafia in this giant, like networking mastermind community just aren't as they don't happen as often. So when I get to have these conversations with people like you or my own guests, I get to have little baby like mastermind conversations that have those synergy moments. I love it. I love it. So if you want to check out Jen's podcast, Creative Queso, you can find that anywhere where you get your podcasts, but you can also check them out online at creativequeso.com. And for my UK listeners, that's queso with a Q-U-E-S-O. We'll put the links in the show notes for you. Um, But then also, if you want to see what Jennifer does with her DIY stuff and crafting and all that, you definitely want to check out her blog and her her website at jenniferperkins.com. So we're online do you like to hang out the most? I am definitely on Instagram the not most. Not my space, right? <laughs> yeah, no, not my space anymore. I, Kicking I it old school. My, I know. Oh, girl, I had a Friendster account. Um, <laughs> so at Jennifer Perkins is like my crafty side. And yep. then at Creative Business or Creative Queso is my like business side. So I kind of, I have three accounts actually, but those are the two main ones I hang out on. Perfect. We'll put those links in the show notes as well. And I, again, you know, if you're going through a major business change, life change, pivot, all of those things, I hope that, you know, just hearing Jen's story, you know, sometimes things are just unknown. Like you just are going into the great unknown uh, in your business. Um, but hopefully you'll you'll find resonance in, in what we talked about today and, and maybe something sparked you. So my last question for you today is this, Jen. And again, thank you so much for your time today. Um, someone somewhere is listening to this episode and she is faced with a massive change coming up. She feels it. She's listening to the trends. She's maybe seen where she's wanting to go right, but the whole world is telling her to turn left left. What's Mm -hmm. one thing that you could whisper into her ear right now, just to encourage her in this big moment? Geez, just like take a breath and like, just know that it like, it's, it's going to be okay. Like life is full of those kinds of pivots and changes. She's, she's done it before and she'll do this one and she'll do it again after that. Like, you know, just be a reed in the water. Like just, you know, just ebb and flow. Just go with the flow. Like it's all going to be fine. It's all going to be so fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Jen, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me.